Hey, Newscast listeners, just want to give you a little information about the mission of the Newscast. Our mission stems from the mission of the Red Smith Banquet, and that mission was to support youth sports in the Fox Valley. Over the 57 years of its existence, we've been honored to give out over a million dollars to various youth sports organizations throughout the Fox Valley. The NoosaCast is looking to continue that mission and support youth sports as well. You can help us do that by donating to the NoosaCast and the Red Smith Sports Banquet. On today's hard-hitting NoosaCast, we're talking roller derby unbelievable conversation with some incredible ladies that play the sport of roller derby here in the Fox Cities. Tash and I take an old look at new like we always do, sponsored by Raleigh Winter and Associates. We get a few things off our mind and it's forgotten and I'm never forgetting. And the Red Smith throwback is the legendary Indy car racer Bobby Ray Hall with the Indianapolis 500 just recently completed. It brought back great memories. So what do you say, folks? Sit back and let's get this show on the road. I hope this is the message that a lot of people get is that I had zero idea that I would be in any way either good at this or enjoy it. And then found out that I wasn't bad and I really, really enjoyed it. Welcome to the NoosaCast. What is a NoosaCast? It's where we bring local folk stories to life through conversation. Welcome, NoosaCast listeners, to another episode of the NoosaCast. Uh, we thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, all you listeners and continuing to come and and uh, enjoy this podcast. We uh, we really feel that we're introducing you to people that you might not know around the area. And, uh, you know, that's that's the uh, purpose of this, to hear everybody's story. Right, Joe? Tosh, we're going to introduce you to a deviled Meg, a pterodactyl and a just the hip. So, yeah, I'd say we're doing pretty good on introducing people to people you might not be familiar with. Yeah, this is a this is an interesting one for sure. Um, we're gonna go hit the sport of roller derby, and uh, if you haven't had an experience with roller derby, you should. I've had an experience once. Uh, that was all the way back at the Players Choice, and you know I remember drinking some Pabst Blue Ribbon and uh, watching just people pummel each other. Oh, it was absolutely. Uh, it was a good good show. <laughs> PBR makes everything better, Tash. You know that. It does. Absolutely. Well, and speaking of that, and, and we mentioned it in the interview with, with the uh, roller derby girls, but June 8th, they, they have their it's 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 roller derby all day at the Fox Cities Convention Center downtown near near Jones Park. Um, but it's 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 actually a big fundraiser for them. I mean, it's there's a cost, obviously, to play roller derby and it'd be a huge help. And, and it'd be great, great entertainment. I trust me, just go down and watch. It. I'm going to go and watch them. And even if you can't make roller derby that night, head down to the Appleton Beer Factory. Shout out Appleton Beer Factory. Great music, great beer. Um, yep. They're going to have their after bar and, and, and everybody's invited. So it'd be, a, it'd be a chance to talk to the girls. We'll, we'll talk about it in the interview, but it's it's an exciting sport and and you know all the ladies out there that listen to the news cast all th what maybe three of you check out roller derby <laughs> check it out it's it's uh it's a cool sport and you too can play yeah they're, they're definitely as we say in the interview they're looking for people and um you know at any skill level so that's what's cool about it so yeah we're going to get to to be introduced to the sport of roller derby, if you know nothing about it, you will at the end of this interview. Well, Tosh, we've already talked drinking. I know this is supposed to be somewhat of a kid's show, but I got to tell you, I discovered a new drink, Tosh, that I kind of like. It involves coffee and a bunch of Irish ingredients, and it's so delicious. And what is it? <laughs> I think they call it an Irish coffee, but it's uh, it's it's uh, coffee, Jameson, and the Baileys, and it's all well stirred, <laughs> and it's, goodness sakes, Tosh, it's good. I've... I've had that, but without the Bailey's, just the whiskey and coffee. Yeah, Bailey's so, takes it to another level. Uh, I'll just stick with the whiskey and coffee. I don't like things too sweet. So <laughs> People are going to think I'm an alcoholic. We're talking liquor and, and drinks, and those are podcasts that you can enjoy, certainly. But yeah, uh, absolutely. I tell you what, Tash, Bailey's and coffee, well-stirred. Well-stirred is the key to this. 
so well, dangerous and so good. <laughs> so if you need your drink in the morning, there you go. That's, that's Joe's right. Joe's got it for you. So <laughs> I'm all well, full of advice for you folks. Yeah. So what other advice do you have for us this week, Joe? Oh, well, Tosh, <laughs> that's, I think I should probably <laughs> stop with the advice. How, how about you? How, how, how was your week? Uh, you know what? This weekend, uh, you know, this is coming out on a Thursday, so we just get through Memorial Weekend. And, uh, you know, we did a lot of yard cleanup from the storms that came through uh, Tuesday, some branches and got the chainsaw out and cut some things up. And, uh, you know, just enjoyed time with family. Uh, we uh, plan in our summer with the uh, construct schedule yes. uh, for where we're heading and, and what we're doing and who's taking who to what city, what weekend. Um, and, uh, we did a little bit of that and checking equipment to see what Ethan needs for new equipments and, you know, new gloves, new elbow sniff pads, the old gloves, one last good uh, sniff. They're actually not terrible, but they're ripping. Yeah. So that's the problem. So yeah, we're going to be purchasing some new gloves and some new elbow pads for the, uh, for the summer season. And, and yeah, hopefully they, they last through next lacrosse season as well. <laughs> That was a weak spot for me, Tash, as an official, when you had to do uh, an equipment check in lacrosse. You're yeah. technically they're supposed to show you the palms of their hands, and they're they're not. You're not supposed to have rips in your gloves. But I always felt okay. bad because as a dad, man, those things are expensive. Kids wear through them they're fast. Not cheap. And, yeah, I hate to penalize a kid because he's got a rip in his glove. So, yeah, and they they're not. You know, I'm not going to criticize, but they're not built overly well. No, not they're at not, all. You know, they could be a thicker material, a thicker leather and stuff in there. Um, hockey gloves seem to be a little thicker than the lacrosse gloves. And I don't know if it's just because of, you know, the temperature and different things like that, but, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I, maybe I need to start designing some lacrosse gloves and see if I can get rich doing that. I highly doubt it, but well, you never know. Tosh worth a shot, worth a shot. Yeah. Indeed. You know, you, you mentioned the storm cleanup. I tell you, somebody that left a storm behind her was Lily Fouts, who we had on last week and you, we, we, Lily and and her teammates they 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 roared through sectionals and, and regionals and and they're onward to state which is going to be well will be going on when this comes out but um i'm sure lily and her teammates will i'm calling it right now tash they're going to dominate state they're they're winning it lily fouts is one state you heard it here that's first. awesome yeah hopefully they do really well uh you know wish them the best of luck and all all the runners from the area who will be competing i know we have you know, runners from Xavier, runners from SVL. Um, I know East has some runners that made it. I, I don't personally uh, know, but I assume that the other high schools have some as well. Yes. Um, and yeah, they're going to, going to uh, go to lacrosse and compete at state, which is a great uh, two days and a fantastic time for those young athletes to showcase what they have. Um, yeah. Just like Joe just showcased a, a transition from a storm to a storm, which was might have been one of the most epic transitions that we've had on the Noosa cast this year. Hey, I'm learning, Tash. I'm learning. I'm getting better <laughs> at this day by day. <laughs> so, yeah, no. All kidding aside, we wish the best of luck to all those uh, young athletes going to uh, state for um, for track and uh, track and field. And, you know, we're also in the midst of playoff season. Um, we're going to, you know, we have N Nina gets the first round by, but um, – they're uh Appleton United is playing Oneida and this would have happened on Tuesday night. And, you know, we'll see what the second round brings uh, for all these teams. So lacrosse is gearing up, softball is gearing up, uh, baseball, you know, Kakata is rolling in softball right Boy, now. So I really expect are. them to have a nice run in the playoffs here. Uh, Kimberly baseball is doing a fantastic job as well. So we'll, we'll be hearing a lot of sports and local sports over the next couple of weeks here. And Tash, there's only one place to get it, AppletonSportsPage.com. That's what that's why we teamed up with Paul. You and I, you know, we 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 have we have our life going on. We, we there's no way we can keep up with all the high school sports, but Paul does a great job. And the news a minute this week, you know, touches on lacrosse. And listen to Paul. Go go to AppletonSportsPage.com and catch up. You're right. This this is this is the time of year. Everything's in full swing. And state, you know, is is basically starting here for for some sports. And over the next couple yeah. of months, it's it's or sorry, the next couple of weeks, it's all about sport. It's state state competition. Yeah. And one other thing, I I didn't forget to mention, but I was going to bring up here as well is uh, we got to sit down, uh, Ethan and myself and and Will 
and we watch the national championship for lacrosse. Yeah. Because, you know, all, all the Will's friends were over on a Saturday night and they were just talking to Ethan about how amazing lacrosse is and they wish they would have played because they can't believe how physical it is. And when it's these last four teams in the national championship, mm-hmm. it's even more physical than, you know, it's just like playoff hockey. You know, you're, you're gunning for the national championship and it was some physical lacrosse. Um, you know, we're recording before we get to watch the game on Monday, but that Notre Dame team, wow. Yeah. They are looking pretty slick. College lacrosse, and that, that's his, I, I like the PLL. It's a little bit different game, but college lacrosse mm-hmm. is the purest form of a full field lacrosse. And you're yeah. right. It's just, it's it's a beautiful game, Tash. Fastest game on grass. Just a beautiful yeah. game. It and they, they just, they played at the highest level. And you're right. It's, it's everything that, that that's what that's the selling point for lacrosse is it, it's everything it, it's physical yeah. it's fast it's scoring it's you know it's big legal hits it's uh yeah you know it's it's all of it it's it's you know subs on the fly and it's right. fast breaks and and just dynamic passes and just it's it's all the sports rolled into one and I mean, you know it, Tosh. I, I, it, it, it sounds like I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm a salesman giving you some BS, you know, pitch. <laughs> but that, that's literally what the sport is. It's, it's that good. Yeah, it is. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's going to gain, gain traction, uh, and we're going to see more of it around here, and uh, we're going to see some opportunities. You know, that's that's the big thing. We're going to see opportunities for kids who might not have a spring sport and want to be involved in something. Uh, this is great because. It's, it's a great team sport. You, you know, you're going to gain some friends. Um, you're going to learn some leadership. You're going to learn things that, uh, that may be important for you down the road as well. And, you know, that's with all sports, uh, just giving opportunities to kids to play. And that, that's what was really cool about this. Absolutely, Tash. It's all about the kids. And for all you roller derby fans that, that tuned in to hear about roller derby, Tash and I are huge lacrosse fans, and sometimes we, we get <laughs> sidetracked on that. So we apologize for that. And Tash, let's show them our, our, our mad podcasting skills and move this segment right on to look at new. What do you say? Sounds like a plan. It's that time again, once again, for an old look at new. Brought to you by Raleigh Winter and Associates. Celebrating 55 years, did you know that in 1962, an Appleton junior high school teacher with a strong work ethic started a residential realty company? His name, Raleigh Winter. Three generations later, the Winters still hold true to a strong work ethic and an excellent reputation in the community. Today, Raleigh Winter and Associates remain actively involved in providing retail, office and industrial users an affordable well-designed working environment through the creation and or acquisition of quality real estate in the fox cities and even beyond new so what do you say let's take an old look at new all right newscast listeners it is time for our look at history it's that old look at new um so we go back and we try to find a little bit of something interesting that took place back in time. Joel, what do you got this week for an old look at new? Well, Tash, you know, I do a lot of walking. I see a lot of houses and it uh, stumbled across. Do you, do you know when the first house was built in Appleton? Absolutely yeah. not. <laughs> 1835, Tash, was the first house in Appleton. It was a rude cabin, but it was it was built down, hmm. down near where Lutz Park is. I don't even think there was an actual street. It was probably just a little trail, but uh, yeah, that okay. was the first dwelling in Appleton. It was built by, get this name, Tosh. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right, but Hippolyte Grigen. And it was about 1835. He, he built this place. It was, it was called the last stopping place for early travelers. Uh, it was known as the White Heron back in the day. So yeah, man, the first little wow. log cabin. It looked like, well, anybody that's our age, you maybe you don't remember this, but any Franklin Roadrunners and or firecrackers, I think we were in the day. Uh, there used to be a log cabin out on the playground. They used to, we used to go on little field trips out there, and they, you yeah. know, do the old school teaching, and and that's kind of what this this drawing of the, of that uh, that cabin looks like uh, for for a visual. So, 1835, first house in Appleton was built. Tash, exciting stuff. So it wasn't 
it wasn't a van down by the river. It was a cabin down by the yeah, river. Ma- so. Maybe a stagecoach down by the river at one time, but uh, <laughs> yeah. No, no Chris Farley. Yeah, no right. van, no van. All right, Tosh. Well, we go from house to what's an old look at new for you, Tosh. What are you looking at? Well, I'm going all the way back to May 29th of 1848. And uh, that day, Wisconsin became the 30th state. And as we all know who grew up in Wisconsin and had Wisconsin history in elementary school, we were nicknamed the Badger Skate because of not Badgers, but because of the miners and how they burrowed in uh, to the hills during the winter. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's a quick one today. Uh, not a lot of context there, but, hey, it's the state of Wisconsin. It's, uh, you know, 1848. And uh, that's when we first became the 30th state in the United States. I love it, Tash. We're feeling it nice and quick. An old look at new brought to you by Raleigh Winter and Associates. All right, folks, we have a unique, rather incredible interview with, like I mentioned before, just the hip deviled mag and pterodactyl and if you don't know what that is you're about to find out so sit back and enjoy some hard hitting action from the roller derby girls so i have to i i think it, funnest isn't isn't a word but I, I i like it and your nicknames are just some of the funnest names i've ever heard <laughs> so you gotta walk me through one why nicknames um and two how do you come about your nicknames i'm sure each has its own individual story yeah um so typically i mean back back in the day um certainly it, it used to be that if you would show up and, and you didn't have a nickname and and there are some skaters who actually skate under their own names that that not not many but some do and um when i started my captain basically threatened all of us new people said you have three weeks to figure it out or i'm going to give you a nickname (laughs) (laughs) and some of them weren't names that you wanted and so they're scrambling and um i like puns and you know the the video of the kid who says i like turtles (laughs) well i like deviled eggs and almost every interview i do i end up saying it and staring off into the middle distance while i say it (laughs) and that's how i got deviled back but every every one of these names then gets shortened so we get one we get a player name but then it gets shortened even further so i'm usually just called d meg all right (laughs) yeah so i um hmm i tried a lot of names and i kept coming up with crazy things like i wanted to be their arachnomaniac for a while um and i just i couldn't come up with anything good and then i was riding in the car with my husband and he goes well you could just be just the hip and i was like oh yep okay um and i have lived into that nickname very well so yeah Mm -hmm. My actual like person aside, and I wanted I wanted almost nothing to do with my name. I, I wanted this to be something totally separate from my life. And I I love dinosaurs. Like I just they fascinate me. I, they're wild. I love them. And so I wanted something punny with the dinosaur. And so a lot of my teammates actually helped me workshop uh, something. And then we kind of landed on pterodactyl uh which i've i've very much been enjoying but like meg says it's it's a mouthful to say so it's it's been just shortened to something nice and easy like dax um to get up while we're off track sure so uh, yeah. it begs the question what's it like say with your work colleagues or sitting around the thanksgiving <laughs> dinner table and, and you know telling telling the whoever that, that you're a roller derby and that you, you know you're, you're dax or you're Devil egg, or you know, whatever your nickname is. I mean, people have to, you have to have some strange looks once in a while. My entire family and most of my work uh, mates kind of looked at me and went, oh, yeah, that tracks. That tracks for who you are. And surprised it took you that long. But so yeah. I, that's just me. <laughs> Basically the same for me. Like, they're like, oh, what? You play roller derby? That makes sense. And I'm like, yeah, I, I know. I was talking to my sister the other day and I was saying that I play like 
a little too aggressively. Um, and she goes, Emily, we've known that since you were a child. And she's like, Why is that still surprising? And I'm like, okay. You're right. <laughs> I love that. So, I, I have the opposite experience. <laughs> so my experience is my family looks at me and says, are you kidding me? Because unless I'm on wheels, I'm a, an absolute klutz. <laughs> I fall down all the time and I destroy things accidentally all the time. And the only time that I'm anywhere close to graceful and fast is when I'm on eight wheels. Um, my students love it. So they think that it's either cool or weird, but they love it enough that they come to the games. Nice. But my family's kind of horrified. They're getting used to it, but they're still kind of horrified. And they keep reminding me of how old I am. Every time I bring up that I've got a game. Do you ever <laughs> teach in your roller skates? Yes. Nice. <laughs> yes, I do. I love that. So I, I'm, a, I'm, a physics, I'm a physics professor. And so um, every term where I, I have to talk about either collisions or transfer uh, of momentum, I'm in my uh, skates the whole day. And so it's a real treat for me because then even in classes where I don't have to be on wheels or if I have to go to uh, uh, a faculty meeting, I'll scoot along in all my gear and, and wheels. <laughs> um, and it's great because all the signs on campus that say no skateboarding, no inline skates, all that, they don't say no roller skates. Exactly. So Ain't that I, I can grind oh, all I want if I, if I want to. It's all about the grind. <laughs> don't, don't tell my employer. <laughs> That's just between us. Nobody will hear that. Now, now we met you guys briefly at Discover Sports at um, Fox City's convention mm. or uh, at the Champions Center back in in February, and we had a blast. It was fun to talk to you guys then. Um, but my only experience with roller derby, I think, was on like ABC Wild World of Sports with the big banked tracks and, and all of that going <laughs> yeah. to town. But I know you guys don't quite play uh -huh. that version. So, I guess in a nutshell, tell us what the heck is roller derby. Okay, um, so roller derby is basically, it's like football, rugby, NASCAR, all kind of into one. We play on a flat track. Um, it is a five-on-five -five game, and the game is broken up into jams, which can be two minutes or less. Um, we have someone uh, with a star on their head, like how Meg has in her picture, um, and then we have someone with a stripe on their head, and that's the pivot. The star is the jammer. The jammer is the only person that can score points. So the whistle blows and the jammers have to go through um, all eight of the people from the other teams of the blockers make it through. And then when they come around again is when they can start to score points. So a, a number of things, and I, I watched some videos and things like that. So it's described as a, as a high impact, fast action, hard hitting. I mean, you guys hammer each other. Yep. But then I started reading the rules and it's it's uh, there's a lot of one. There's a lot of officials, it seems like. So they, they seem like yes. they're calling a, a lot of uh, a lot of fouls, maybe. But if I'm reading the rules correctly, there's no way you guys follow the rules by the letter of the law. Do you? I mean, it seems like like just the blocking alone and things like that. I mean, you guys are hooking and holding and uh, you're getting after it. So, I mean, so we sit up. So there is the, the rule book is I don't, it's like 50 pages long. And you, it's it, like hockey. If you get um, a penalty, you you sit out, and the other team then has an advantage. Sure. And um, we, a lot of the penalties are the kinds of penalties that you would see in American football, right? In terms of where you can block and how you can block. And then there's some penalties that have to do with the kind of game that we're playing in terms of advancing your position illegally. But when it comes down to it, you can't hit people in the head. You can't hit them below the knees. You can't smash into their back. You can't punch people. You can't hook them with your arms and things like that. It's all the kinds of things you, you would think you couldn't do in American football. You can't do on eight wheels either. Sure. Okay. So I'm, I should have told you before, I'm a, I am a former official. It's my first year not officiating, so I officiate lacrosse and football. So I'm, I'm probably oddly okay. obsessed by rules, and, and I'm fascinated by your game because I understand in the trenches, my, my job in football was to watch the line of scrimmage. And, and it, it seems like when you guys start yeah. off and you're trying to get that jammer through that that pack, that that's that's like offensive line play in, in football. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um that first like 30 feet from when the whistle blows is sometimes like what determines the whole 
jam. So like if one of those people, one of those jammers breaks out fast, they're gone and we're just sitting there scrumming and just trying our best to keep the opposing jammer in place while that other team is actively trying to get them out. So when that jammer breaks through, is that, I, I, what is a whip? Is that, is that jammer then starting to whip mm-hmm. one, once they break through? So a whip is, it, it can, uh, any player can use it, but usually when you see it is when a jammer is using her own person to try and get through either to score or to get out of that scrum. So you're grabbing whatever you can. You can you can always grab whatever you need to on your own teammate okay. to just advance your position. And so, and, and you're basically transferring momentum. I'm sorry, I'm a physics professor, so I have to understand it that <laughs> way. So you're just transferring that momentum and getting a little bit more speed out so you can get free of all of those big blockers. Do you, I think I saw a video of you. Do you still have purple hair? I love your hair. Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> My students realize that I've had 17 different color hair uh, in, in the time that they've known me. <laughs> That's the best. So you're a jammer. You have a star on your helmet. I mean, is that just mm-hmm. – are you just attracted to that position? Is that kind of like a running back? You're seeking the hole, trying to get to get through, mm-hmm. and that, that's that's got to be yeah. pretty athletic. I think the best – yeah, the best analogy, the two best analogies that I've tried to describe to say my dad or family members is that I'm, I'm, it's like a running back position, or it's like NASCAR, but you're the car, um, and because you get, you just get beat up on the way through. And um, when I, I started twelve years ago, I had no idea what I was doing, and it, this just turned out to be something that I was that I was pretty good at, and also I'm not particularly good at blocking sure <laughs> so that narrowed it down for me you bring up a point um and i know we're kind of going through the rules and stuff but i i just i'd like to know how you guys got into this in the first place i mean Ooh, what okay. what drew you to it and because it's not like you played it in high school and there was <laughs> a it was a gym class with it so so what drew you to this to this sport Um, So I was an athlete from littleness. I played basketball. I played softball. Um, In college, I played intramural volleyball. Um, And then I moved up to the De Pere area and I didn't know anybody. And my now husband was like, you need to make friends. You need to make friends. I'm like, I don't know how to do that. And I saw a poster for it in a bathroom um, at a bar. And I was like, well, that is the sport for me because I am (laughs) aggressive too aggressive i don't know i'm a very competitive person and this was the perfect sport for me um i had never skated though before and and i just showed up and i was like they're gonna teach me how to do that part right and then the rest (laughs) kind of knew how to do so you bring up an interesting point and actually it was a question i wanted to ask you so you did not really know how to skate going into this nope how is it so obviously then the you guys teach somebody how to skate basically Yeah. yeah Actually, do you want to talk about that, Dax? Yeah, I can. So I actually just joined the team, what, four months ago? So I started January 1st. Um, and the last time I roller skated, I think I was eight, and I spent most of the time on my butt. And I was like, oh, I don't like this. So um, coming in with zero to no experience, and it's been uh, like an absolute joy. So they teach you kind of the basics first. Uh and that really kind of helps. So the first thing they teach you is how to fall because you're going to do it a lot. Uh, but they teach you how to fall appropriately and safely so that way you can get back up and you can keep going. And it's such a very warm and welcoming and inviting environment um, that you get really excited to continue to learn and go back and you see yourself improve like every single time. It's been, it, it actually is really great. So again, I, yeah, I've a pair of roller blades, roller skates, ice skates, anything like that. And and I'm not great right now, but I definitely am getting there. And I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I look forward to every single practice I get to get to. How did you get hooked? How, how did you find roller derby? Uh, so I actually just moved up here from Texas. And um, down there, I was having a hard time finding friends. And one of my coworkers, or it was one of my husband's coworkers, was in roller derby. And... The roller derby was like two hours away, but every time she saw me, she was like, you'd be perfect for this. You need friends. Let's do this. It's active. She's like, I don't even play anymore, but you need to be in this. And I was like, if someone who hasn't played this sport in years 
still can't shut up about it. There has to be something to this. Yeah. So when I moved up to Wisconsin and I was so kind of like hip, I was like, well, I want to make some new friends. I want to stay active because I've always been active. I was like, you know what? Let's, let's just give this a try. What's the worst that happens? Uh, you get addicted and hooked and you're there every single practice having the best time of your life. That's what, that's the worst that happens. <laughs> That's a that's a pretty good worst. I like that. Yeah, I know. Meg, how did you get started? Oh, so um, so I wasn't into sports at all. Um, I think I started running when I was forty five, um, and then I turned out to be okay at that. And then when I was forty six, I was at a friend's uh, birthday dinner and. Like hip, I saw one of these flyers in the bathroom, mm-hmm. and we had had enough beers at this uh, <laughs> birthday uh, dinner that we said, "Let's do this." And I hadn't been on skates since Jimmy Carter was president. Nice. Um, so, so I went, and and naturally, the two of my friends who had who were way better skating, um, one of them got injured, and the other lost interest, and and. Um, all of a sudden I found that I really loved it. I loved the, the contact. I loved, I love the fact that I'm older than everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes substantially older than everyone. Um, and this is the first team sport that I've been on. So I've learned, um, I've learned what it's like to be part of a team. I've, I've been a coach as well, and I've played in leagues um, here in the Midwest and in Washington. And so it's really been a different aspect of my life. Um, Something that, and I think a lot of people, I hope this is the message that a lot of people get, is that I had zero idea that I would be in any way either good at this or enjoy it, and then found out that I wasn't bad and I really, really enjoyed it. I will say that I thought I was going to be good at it. (laughs) (laughs) I I love that message because somebody older as well, um, you know, re kind of rediscovering life a little bit. You're right. I mean, you get past that fear and you just try something new. You're right. It's just, it's almost pure enjoyment after that. It's, it's just, it's so worth getting past that fear. And it sounds like all you guys have, have have kind of done that to, to dive into roller, uh, roller derby. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, there's there's a little bit of fear, and I get nervous. So I'm I'm kind of famously nervous before every bout. I've been part of Derby since 2012, and I still get sick to my stomach the morning mm-hmm. of a of a game. Um, and it, and it just doesn't go away until that first whistle. Mm-hmm. Um, but once I'm in the game, it's it's I can't think of anything other than playing and wanting to get back out on the floor. Get impatient to get back out there. Meg, it's kind of empowering, isn't it, to be to be the oldest one out there, but yet be the youngest one and just be a total badass, and everybody just respects you. I love that. Well, I mean, so I like to think that I was a badass for all the other things I did <laughs> in my life, but yes, being almost fifty nine and being out there is is kind of a thing. So I like it. <laughs> That's a good one. One of the things each of you seemed to bring up was uh, friendship, mm. and it sounds like. Mm-hmm. Your team and your your competitors, your, the camaraderie that you've developed is huge for each of you. Yeah, um, I so I joined in 2010 and I was 22 years old, and I have invited these people to weddings, baby showers, <laughs> housewarmings, and they've come. Like they're like my family that shows up, and it's not like two of them show up; mm-hmm. it's like 20 to 30 of them show up, and it's amazing, <laughs> and I love it. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's like I said. There's I have this. And, and people talk about this, but it's really true. Is I have this Derby family that I, I I've had for 12 years, both in Wisconsin and Washington. Uh, when I was on sabbatical in in Seattle, I got to play out there. And um, if you're what I've discovered, which I think we all have, is that when when you find yourself in a new place. And as hard as adults to make friends, Derby was such a great place to do that. And and those friendships are meaningful and last the test of time. I'm still in contact with, with many of the people that I play with that are not part of Derby anymore. Um, I miss, I, I retired for a couple of years and then came back 
and really missed everybody there. So diving and, into to a little more specifics of roller derby, when, when is the season? Kind of what does the season look like? And then what is the time commitment mm -hmm. for, for you? What, what are practices like? What's a typical week or typical month of roller derby? Yeah, so our season, um, it has just switched. Um, our governing organization, which is the Women's Flat Track Roller Derby Association or WIFTA, um, they are kind of forcing everyone into like a calendar year, like a January through October type season. Um, so you can like be practicing and stuff outside of that, but they want all gameplay to kind of fit into that time frame. Um, and so that's new for us. And so our home season is um, June 10th. I always, I'm getting the date. Yeah, it's after June yeah. 15th, 16th, something like that. It's June. Um, so our home games are going to be June through August. And we're going to put five games in there, two of them large events, the Supper Club Showdown and the um, Brock Paper Valley Scissors. And then we're going to have three kind of games at our practice space in between there. Um, but we've been playing games since February. We're... We're going to Fargo this week. I'm trying to think. We've had one. I think we've played three or four games up until now, and now we finally get to come home and play at home. So when you go to Fargo, I mean, is that what kind of time commitment is that for you guys? And do you, do you have pretty flexible jobs where you're able to take off or are you using vacation time? <laughs> <laughs> All great questions. Yeah. Um, it, it varies for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we usually, it's usually a Friday through Sunday type thing. So we'll mm -hmm. drive, you know, eight, nine hours to get somewhere to play a game on Saturday night and then turn around and come right back home. Sure. Um, most of the cost is on us as well. We do some reimbursements through our organization, but it's just out of our pocket because we love playing the sport. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, Absolutely. How are your bodies after a game? I mean, are you pretty beat up? Are you pretty sore? How, how is it getting out of bed the next day? I'm the bruiser, so I usually feel. <laughs> so what I found, I mean, I I don't actually hurt that much the next morning. Sometimes, sometimes, especially if I'm scrimmaging hip. Um, it's a little difficult getting out of the bed in the morning, but what I'm finding as I get older is that um, we have, if we have a uh, if we play in the evening, I'm still a little excited the rest of the night, sure. so I don't sleep the the rest of the night. And I used to way back when I was younger and 46. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so our practices, we offer three practices a week, um, Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, generally from seven to nine. Um, we ask our skaters to be there um, about 50% to about 65%. So it's like one to two practices a week um, based on like, you know, based on your schedule. We all have lives on top of this. Um, and I mean, that's really it. Like we we ask people to be there. We practice up to three times a week, and then we have games about once a month right now. Uh, how long does a bout typically last? And 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 I guess what what are typical scores? Is the is there? I'm assuming there's a lot of scoring in the game. Can be. <laughs> yeah, it's um. So there's the amount of strategy that goes into the game, but then also like the scoring points part um is very intense. Um, so. Like our rankings are based off of how few the other team scores or how many you score. Um, but for example, I think right now our our uh, All Stars team is averaging about 200 points a game, and the the teams that we're playing are averaging about 100. So we're doubling up a lot of people's okay. scores. Um, games are two 30 minute halves, and then we usually have like a 10 to 20 minute halftime, depending on the type of event. Sure. Do you on some of your larger events are you putting like some production into, you know, the, the lights and the halftime entertainment, things like that. Is there, there a lot of that, that type of stuff The like what the timber rattlers do, things like that. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, again, we don't, for an all day event, we don't know what that's going to look like, but prior to that, we always, we always bring in a national anthem singer and then like three halftime shows. So like two little ones, that'll be like skateboarders and the um, aerial dance type people. Yeah. And then we'll do like a bigger halftime or we'll do like games or something like that. Like we do try to fill all of that time for people. Yeah. And Emily, you're doing, is that, does that fall on you? Are you kind of the event planner for a lot of this? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are much more creative and talented people that do a lot of that. Um, so we have five different committees in our league and each committee is responsible for some aspect. So usually our marketing and events committees are the ones that 
um, plan and organize a lot of those things. And so. you guys are pretty active on social look, looking around the last last couple of days. I mean, that, that's, uh, you know, the world's changed so much in the last number of years. And, and that, that's a big part of it. You guys look like you're doing your part on, on the social side. <laughs> I mean, it takes time to have an active social media. Like that's a job in itself. Oh, it, yeah, it, it really is. is. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've like I've done it for other organizations, and if you aren't on it, you just you get lost in everything. Yeah, you you really do. Hey, Newsacast listeners, you can find every episode on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Please help us grow by subscribing or sharing the Newsacast with friends, or follow us on Facebook, X, TikTok, or Instagram. A huge thank you to Digstown for all the music in today's episode. Catch a gig or find them on Spotify. Head over to our YouTube channel to get exclusive content like the full interviews and speeches from past Red Smith banquets. Northeastern Wisconsin Sports Advancement is a 501c3 organization. Our mission is to raise money, provide support, and bring greater awareness for youth sports organizations in Northeast Wisconsin. What other are, are you guys? I, I mean, I'm assuming you have to do some training. There's got to be a lot of cardio involved. I mean, it, it's is yeah. it pretty much year round training for for you guys to just to, to stay on top of your game? I mean, yeah, basically. Yeah. There are some of us that'll play like we play on um, some more. What are they called? Like mixed charter teams. So some some of our skaters are playing in like two different leagues right now. Mm -hmm. um, so there is on top of going to practice. There's all of the cross training that a lot of us do outside of sure. it. Um, and then like film watching all of that like it is yeah. a part-time job oh that's also so you videotape your yeah we totally study film. yeah that's huge i mean i i remember using that in, in, in football and lacrosse i mean you you learn a lot by mm -hmm. watching film mm -hmm. so in, in in looking kind of the layout of roller derby you, you have and forgive me for just these elementary questions but you have the nine the the 920 honeys uh you have the all-star mm -hmm team i mean guess what what are the teams in the area who's all playing how many teams are there and then kind of uh, maybe what levels are, are they if that's the appropriate question so for us we have we have um typically um if you go to a city uh where there's roller derby you might find one or two depending on the, the size of the city but for typically in wisconsin there's one league and and that's where we you might have 40 or so players that are different levels and sometimes you'll have that includes the the skating officials the non-skating officials people who are just starting and that generally separates into two different teams ones that in our case it's the 920 honeys which is which tend to be newer skaters um but not necessarily and then the all-stars and the all-stars are the that's the team that carries our international ranking um, and so when we go um, play someone, we, we're playing for moving up in the rankings and ultimately hoping to move to a playoff. Um, if you, the kinds of teams locally, there are teams in Madison, Milwaukee, um, Eau Claire, uh, Lacrosse, uh, Chicago. White slash Wausau. Yeah. Um, so the, we, we, we tend to see those, but we also... Um, we typically, when we travel, we travel to uh, Chicago. So in the last, I guess in the last year, we traveled to Chicago, Lansing, not Lansing, Flint. Um, and then we had some home games. Uh, this year, we traveled down to Madison for a tournament. Uh, we traveled down to Rockford and we're about to go to Fargo before we start playing at home. And I think that's pretty typical for a lot of leagues. Some of the bigger leagues might travel further, uh, farther than that. So most most clubs, most teams, I mean, these venues are, I guess, wherever you can find space, right? I mean, you guys alone have, have had a, a few different venues just in the last few years, correct? Yeah, <laughs> it's a problem, yeah. Um, especially with, with the pandemic. Um, a number of teams and a number of leagues that are, are internationally ranked and sort of perennial uh, playoff teams have lost their venues, have lost their either their hockey rinks or their skating rinks that they either practice in or have their games in. And so there's a bit of a, 
um, a scramble to find those different spaces where you can uh, have those games, but also in some ways, more importantly, have that practice space so that you're getting that muscle memory, you're getting to learn how your teammates react to you, and that you can train um, new skaters like Dax so that they can get in and mix it up with somebody somewhere else. What are the dimensions of, of your track? I mean, what, what, what type of space are we talking about? Yeah, so it's usually when we're looking for a space, we're looking for like, I would say 20,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. um, and that gives us a track plus like adequate space around it to be safe. Um, so it's about, I think our track, I want to say is like 120 long by like 75 wide mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's a nice oval, but it needs like you can't have um, posts. You can't have anything in that space. And that's what we run into is we find bigger spaces, but then there's too many poles or there's just stuff that sure. gets in the way of like crashing into each other safely yeah that makes sense i mean you guys like you guys hammer each other i can see you fly right off the track uh -huh. <laughs> did, do you get quite a few fans at, in in some of these uh venues it's got to get kind of rowdy <laughs> rowdy is the right word yeah. um yeah we have like when we were playing at the oshkosh arena they were saying that we were getting about 500 people in for each game wow <laughs> Um, we, when we play at Skater's Edge, which is where we practice in Appleton, we can fit maybe 300 in there, but that's pushing yeah. it. It's probably not that much. It just feels like that sure. much. Yeah. Um, but I've also played in front of like 5,000 people wow. in a different wow. arena just for a different, yeah, that was up. Like you were like, Oh my God. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, that was cool. I played in front of, I think 1500, a thousand people and that's, and it was early on in my career. And that was the first time I saw my name on like a jumbotron. Yeah, and I was just staring at it, and the whistle blew, and I was still staring at it. And the opposing jammer just knocked me down. I saw stars. I just, but it was worth it. Yeah, heck yeah, <laughs> name and lights. No, that's got to get the blood boiling and, and just all fired up and, and, and ready to fly. So you, you do have a big event coming up, the, the, the Supper Club Showdown, and that, that's the Fox City's uh, Convention Bureau. So that's got to be a pretty nice space for you guys and pack a lot of people in there and get loud. So I guess one, what's a day like there for you guys? A lot of games. A lot of bouts, a lot of bouts. Let me use the correct terminology. <laughs> no clue. We haven't done it before. Um. Yeah. So, I mean, we've played in tournaments and it's going to be, you know, we're going to have to be there at like 7 a.m. and we'll still be there at 10 o'clock tearing down. Um, it's a by us, for us type thing. Um, so we put everything on, we set everything up, um, but we give two hour time slots to each game and we're going to have five games that day. Yeah, it's going to be exhausting. But then we party afterwards and it makes mm -hmm. up. So I was reading about that. Where, where is the after bar again? Appleton Beer Factory, right on college. Perfect. So hypothetically, if there's a letter carrier that has to work that day and, and can't make the actual <laughs> bouts, but but likes to go to after bars, is, is that that's okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Please do. Cool. <laughs> so do you need volunteers for that event? Yes. And if you do, how do people sign up and how do people help you out? Yeah, great question. So we great have an question. email. It's volunteerfcrd at gmail.com. Um, and you reach out there and we can start assigning jobs. We need people to help us take, um, like be in the ticket booth to check people in. We need security help. We need EMTs if people are like certified in that. Um, what else do we need? We need merchandise sellers. We need people like that. We don't need people that know anything about roller derby. We just need bodies to help us fill those auxiliary roles. Is is this your major fundraiser for, for, for the year? I mean, is this, this pretty much where you make your cash? Yeah. This is where we make a lot of our money. We do some larger fundraising, like we will do some of that Lambeau field where you staff the concession stands and get that, um, you get a portion of the proceeds. Um, but yeah, our games are where we make the money that then help us pay for travel or help us pay for new skaters to have gear to try, things like that. Now that brings up another point, uh, new skaters. How do people get involved with you and... You know, what, what are, what are the people, it sounds like you're just looking for people who want to have some fun and be able to hang with you and do some stuff, but how would somebody get involved? 
Yeah. So again, um, you email us or you can reach out to us on social media. So our email is foxcitiesderby at gmail.com. And then we're Fox Cities Roller Derby on all different social medias. Um, you reach out there and then you are emailing me. And I am the one saying, this is what you need. You don't actually need anything to show up aside from a, a fitted mouth guard and a water bottle. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, we have everything to try. And you just show up and we teach you, like um, Dax said, we teach you how to fall and stop. And then we just keep progressing you up. Yeah, and every, every practice has typically a practice runner and then somebody that will help people who are, who are new. So... You won't be left to your own devices to to move around. I had my first practice. I had someone hold my hand the, the whole <laughs> two hours around the rink. That's not unusual for people who end up playing years later. It's a lot of our experience at first practice. Yeah, yeah. My first practice, I don't think anyone talked to me, and I just had to like <laughs> skate back and forth, just trying to figure out how to stay up. Oh, that's huge to to be welcoming and and especially in, in a in a sport where you need players, I mean, why not be welcoming? Do, do a lot of folks yeah. stick with it or is it, it do, do a lot of folks just come and try it one time and move on? Or is it a, is it a mix? We did a boot camp last year for the first time and we probably had 40 people come and try that for like eight weeks. We had five people sign up. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's about where it usually is at. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things I was wondering, um, do you, have like workshops and stuff for like youth and maybe uh maybe mm. some kids who want to come in and what do you do special to try to hook them in yeah so we do not right now okay um it is a goal of ours uh there used to be junior roller derby in the valley where okay. it was uh i don't know what age it started but up and through 17 before you turned 18 and could come to the adult league um, and that went on for a few years and we just, we don't have the personnel to run something like that mm -hmm. anymore. Um, I know we're starting to flirt with the idea of maybe getting a grant to open something like that back up again. Um, but we do last year, we hosted an event that was open to all ages and we were primarily trying to talk to younger girls, um, who are interested in sports since so many of them do drop off in, um, like once they start to hit puberty, uh, girls yeah. stop playing sports so much. Mm -hmm. And so we did an event called love your body with Fox city's roller derby, where we just talked about our different body types and how they benefit us on the track. So we're not all the same shape and size, but we are all very effective at what we're doing on the track. Mm -hmm. Do you guys all play other sports or is this pretty much it right now? Or is this, has this led you to, to explore other things? Well, that's a good question. Um, I sometimes play pickup softball, um, but I am a landscaper for my job. So I usually use that to just train. Yeah. For oh, that's, that's a physical job. <laughs> no doubt. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, I'm a marathoner uh, before I started and um, I didn't, I didn't do any kind of strength training until I think my fifth or sixth year in roller derby, when I realized I, I this could make me, this would help. <laughs> and it does. Yeah. Surprise. It really does help. It helps uh, whether you're playing roller derby or not, especially if you're in your fifties to do something like strengthening your core and do strengthening exercises. So I do a lot of off skates cross training. I love that. Yeah, and I am wrong because when I said I don't play sports, but then Meg said marathoning, which I don't is a sport. I just don't think of it as a sport. I'm so sorry. <laughs> a team sport. I do strongman events and stuff oh, like that. Yeah. Also, all right. I tend to play tennis when I'm when I've got time. So, um, tennis. which is very very different from roller derby, <laughs> especially if I'm playing singles. <laughs> there is no teammate. There is no. Yeah. Uh, contact, there's nothing, but it, I, I, I am surprisingly just as intimidating on the tennis court as I am, right, as I try <laughs> to be on the track. <laughs> so do you come to the net quite a bit, intimidation at the net? Oh, yeah, yeah, because yeah, I'm bigger, yeah. and if I, you know, tear back a screech, they get scared, and they run away. <laughs> and I don't know if you know that it's going to be with the other person with the ball, it's your point, so fair game. <laughs> You'll have to uh, start to charge admission to that. I think you might uh, might be able to make a nickel or two. 
Yeah. <laughs> month of, of, of June, we, we have the Supper Club coming up. Um, but what, what, what other schedule, what other opportunities do we have to come and watch you ladies uh, do your thing? <laughs> um, okay, so we have our Supper Club showdown on June 8th. And then June 29th, we have our first game at um, Skater's Edge. And then we have a July and August game at Skater's Edge. Um, July 20th is a home game at Skater's Edge. And August, August 10th is a home game at Skater's Edge. And then we have our last expo event, Rock Paper Valley Scissors, on August 24th, which will be back at the expo. And is there usually is do you charge admission to get in? Concessions? Yeah. Like so that? for the two large expo events, it's um twenty dollars for all day. And then I think if you are a, a Lawrence grad that day, you're getting a discount. If you're I think children are a discount. I'm sure like vets, those types of things are all discounts. Um and then our edge games, usually we were doing like ten dollars a ticket. We haven't done those in a really long time, but those are definitely more affordable. Sure. Mm-hmm. And a a much different um introduction to it because it's gonna be a lot um lower production. Like it's just us playing each other and you guys learning about roller derby. Right. It's it's very much Hip and I were talking about this yesterday, I think. It's it's really old school. It's like the way derby was played when we were first playing. Yeah. It's yeah. like when I think of derby and my favorite memories of derby, it's playing in a rink where the the audience is right up, right next to you, and, and you can get hit into the crowd. Oh, yeah. And, and it's just it, – it, it was so much fun. And, yes, it's great to be in an arena and have – thousands of people watching you, but there's something about that intimate setting and the feeling that you're watching something that was put together by a group of people that really love this sport and love being yeah. together that really is just wonderful. It feels more underground. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, very that much. grassroots, yeah. That, yeah, that's a great feeling. Yeah. It means, I think it means more. Yeah. I, I do have a, a question. So if you were to make a pitch to somebody who's thinking about joining roller derby and want to give it a try, what's your like elevator pitch? What are you going to say to them? Mine is not very good because I'm just like, oh, you find that interesting? You should show up and do it. Like, I'll bring you. I'll take <laughs> you from your house to there if you're nervous about showing up. <laughs> so it's not a good one. Meg, you got a oh. better one? I, I don't know. I think so. I think... Um... Try something new that's scary and you'll be surprised. Yeah. All right. I don't know if that works, but that's exactly the way I felt. I mean, I was, I did have a couple beers when I decided it. Um, <laughs> that helps. That always helps. It was a great decision. Yes. <laughs> and it is, it, I mean, I think the scariest, and, and this is something that people should, should realize and not beat themselves up about. The scariest thing that I ever did with respect to Derby was go to that first practice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I was driving to that first practice, I was nervous. I was going to a place where um, I had no idea what to expect. My image of Derby before my first practice was like what you were saying, what I saw in the 70s on television. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I showed up to the rink and I was and I was expecting to see a whole bunch of people who were not going to pay attention to me, who knew all of this stuff that they were doing. And I, I showed up. I didn't even know I had a bicycle helmet for my helmet for my first practice. Because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. And, and <laughs> um, I, I did, my dad went to that first practice uh, with me and he took these very adorable, adorable pictures of me standing straight up in this bicycle helmet on that first practice. <laughs> but the whole time there, I was like, well, maybe w- we can say the car got stuck. No one will know if I didn't go. <laughs> and, and and then walking in, everyone was so friendly. Somebody took me by the hand. And anything else after that was, was nothing compared to taking that first step. So do, do something new that you think is scary and you're going to be surprised. And you're going to be surprised because there's so many people there that are doing it too. 
That's nice. tremendous advice for anything in life. It's such a non-judgmental environment. It's most of us, I, like Mike said, it's a, it's terrifying going that first time. You don't know what to expect. You don't know how bad you're going to be. But it, there is such a nurturing and non-judgmental environment because we all remember that first day that we were there clinging to the sides for dear life um, and spending probably most of the time on the floor because we've fallen. And so because of that, you know, we're all there to kind of help the way you up and, and, you know, make sure you're learning and enjoying and having fun. And so you can learn something about yourself. You learn um, skills and things that you didn't know you had inside you. And it's, it's, it really is fantastic. Do you, uh, Meg, I wanted to ask you just real quick, have you ever, uh, have you ever skated on the high bank, the, the old school roller derby rink? I, I did. Um, I did get a chance in uh, Washington just once. And uh, once was enough. <laughs> really? It was scary. Yeah. Oh, I know. I want to try so bad. I'm going to a big. Um, it, was it was fun. <laughs> I'm going to a big con, and they're going to have one, and I want to try it. Oh, you should. You absolutely should. Um, it uh, maybe the perspective. My perspective as a jammer is different. Um, but um, I, I totally could. I was just totally concerned about going over the rail the whole time. <laughs> the physics of like going up the bank and then coming and picking up speed going down that was pretty cool yeah i'm yeah. not good at stopping <laughs> oh yeah <that's laughs> i like cool. that part because you're not supposed to stop <laughs> i've been told it feels like you're flying yeah <laughs> just not always on your wheels <laughs> <laughs> Are physics always running through your head when, when you're playing? I mean, are you like calculating angles and things like that? Is it just natural for you? Yes. <laughs> but that's because I'm a nerd. <laughs> sure. That's um, all right. When I, 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 I do tend to run, I, I run, I'm one of the regular practice runners. And the way that I, and I'm a teacher. And so this is a different way for me to teach. And the way that I try and grapple with describing things like whips or how you absorb a hit and how you extend the, the contact uh, with a hit to dissipate the energy so it's not as hard a hit. All comes from physics and the kinds of things that I do um, in my job and in real life. So, so have your I'm constantly have your reflexes almost been trained that like you could absorb a hit maybe differently because you're understanding the physics? Absolutely. We just did a drill yesterday, mm -hmm. the stop touching me drill, um, where you basically line up with two people and you're on your toe stops and you're trying to basically train your body to work like the matrix while you, so you're on your, on your skates and your skates aren't moving, but your body is kind of, uh, go extending the length of the hit so that you can stay in bounds. And the whole point of practice is to get that muscle memory so that when in a, in a game setting, you don't have time to think, but your muscles and your body reacts and, and remembers, okay, instead of just taking a hit head on, you kind of dance absorb around. that and dance around that and let that hit flow through you and then. It's also really great at practice because there's so many different minds and how they explain things. So I- Yeah, physics works. Heck yeah. <laughs> I'm not a physicist, and I like using physics. I love the way Meg does and explains things because I'm a physics and a science nerd too. But there's so many other perspectives on, on, you know, people teaching and learning. But as you're learning, you pick up different things from these different styles of how they're teaching. So it's it's nice not having just one style being taught to you, um, that you kind of gravitate towards what works best for you and because we have so many different personalities and so many different styles it i think it really helps me understand different things differently depending on what i'm learning so it's it's actually really enjoyable having multiple people running different practices and learning things in a different way no that's a great perspective and gosh you guys need to write a book you guys are is life lessons here <laughs> Well, Tosh, I mean, th this has been fascinating. I, I, I know it's getting a, yeah, a little bit late absolutely. at night. I, I, we didn't even get into. I know you guys all have normal jobs as well. Uh, roller <laughs> derby is kind of a side gig, so it's. Uh, I, I know you all have busy schedules, and 
thank you one for for just sharing yeah. your time with us i i definitely going to try to get to the supper club if, if nothing else i'm going to do the after bar um you know j- yeah. just for research purposes <laughs> and to introduce myself but uh yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. yeah thank you so much for having us we really appreciate opportunities like this yeah absolutely All right, NoosaCast listeners, you are in for a thrilling throwback uh, with the Nat, with the uh, great Bobby Ray Hall, uh, American uh, driver. Uh, he drove the open wheels in the IndyCar. Um, he was here at the Red Smith Sports Banquet in 1999. Uh, it was an excellent interview, and we really enjoyed having him. What you're about to hear is only part of the speech by Bobby Ray Hall. The entire full interview is on our YouTube channel. Just search NoosaCast or check out the link in the show's notes. Head over to the YouTube and watch the entire speech. Uh, we haven't had many race car drivers here, and it was an excellent look with the WIR just down the street. So please sit back and enjoy the interview with Bobby Ray Hall. Red Smith Sports Awards. Banquet Throwback. Red Smith Award, of course, goes to someone who has made some unique contributions to sport in Wisconsin and also epitomizes the great values that Red Smith exhibited. Let's give a Red Smith welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, this year's Miller Nice Guy Award winner, Mr. Bobby Ray Hall. Thank you. Thank you. It is an, uh, indeed a pleasure for me to, um, to be with you all tonight. And I want to thank the Red Smith Committee for this great honor and for Miller Brewing Company. Um, for those cynics out there, you might think I received this award because of my long valued relationship with the Miller Brewing Company. Sounds like there's more than a few of you out there. <laughs> well, I am a nice guy, all right? <laughs> now, um, it, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with all of you. You know, as a racing car driver, you don't often get the chance to, um, to go to events like this uh, because uh, it's not often that little towns or big towns or any town produces that many race car drivers. We're always looked a little bit, you know, with a jaundiced eye, I guess, by the sports press because uh, the questions always seem to come out about whether it's an athletic endeavor or not, or they always think you've had a bad childhood because you must have been drag racing or something, but, <laughs> but really, we're not bad people. We're racing car drivers, and so it's, it's great to represent my my sport in events like this, and I'm very flattered uh, to be here. You know, I, uh, I got to know Paul through Robin, uh, I don't know, it was probably about five, six years ago, and, and watched with uh, a lot of uh, glee. Uh, it, was, it was great. We'd go up to race in Toronto, and Paul was up in Toronto, and we don't race up in the Minneapolis area, but I want to congratulate you. I, I think we picked the right time to retire, both of us. Um, baseball's a little safer than driving a race car, but then again, I don't know if I'd want to stand in the box with some of these pitchers these days. Um, I come up here quite often, actually. Um, growing up uh, in the Chicago area, I had the good fortune to spend a lot of time at Elkhart Lake. And uh, so I come up here quite often to participate in what I think is the greatest racing circuit in North America and certainly one of the greatest in the world. Um, we were talking earlier tonight about I was, I was asked to be on the board of Elkhart a few years ago, and I couldn't say yes fast enough because to me Elkhart Lake represented all that was great about automobile racing. And I have to say that I think a lot of that is due to the people, aside from the actual track, is due to the people in Wisconsin who make everybody feel so welcome. Uh, all of you have been so hospitable over the years, and I, thank, I think on behalf of all of racing I want to thank you 
for that. It truly is a wonderful place to race and a wonderful place to go and watch races. So with that, I don't want to, I know we all want to uh, get on to Peter, but I, I want to thank all of you. I'm very proud to be here with you tonight, and I thank you for inviting me. All right, Tash, another roaring throwback with Bobby Ray Hall. One of the few race car drivers that came to Red Smith, but uh, it was good to hear him and Indianapolis 500, Tash, the greatest spectacle in racing. It's true. Yeah, it's great events. I mean, everybody watches it, at least a little of it, right? Absolutely. Or listens to it on the radio, even. I remember doing that as a kid. Yeah, absolutely. Well, anyway, Tash, we're coming to a close of another fantastic Noosa cast, and we can only end it one way with a little It's Forgotten and I'm Never Forgetting. So, Tash, what's forgotten in your world? Well, this may be unpopular around uh, this area right now, but I am ready to forget not the upcoming draft in Green Bay, but the countdown to the draft (laughs) in Green Bay. Come on now. Because it's on every single day. Countdown to count countdown to the to the 2025 draft. Yeah. It's a countdown. It's you know a long ways away. But I'm sick of hearing that countdown to the draft. I mean, it is a big deal and I'm excited for it as well, just like everybody else is. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm tired of the countdown. We even got the countdown clock at Lambo now. And uh so Tosh, yeah. I, I thought the exact the same thing the other day too. I saw that and I thought you gotta be kidding me, but you know what? They are gonna absolutely milk that for every single absolutely. ounce they can get out of that. Yep, every single day I hear it. So what's what's gonna be bigger? Good. The countdown to the draft or the presidential election? What's gonna happen in October and November? The two are gonna <laughs> clash. Well, I we probably shouldn't get to that point nah, right now. That, that's true. That's forgotten. <laughs> let's, not, let's not talk. That's politics. forgotten. That's forgotten. <laughs> I'm never forgetting. Right, that's forgotten political politics. So, so Joe, what are you? Uh, what do you want to forget? Well, Tash, it's not what I want to forget, but I think it's what people are forgetting. It's it's forgotten is, is the stars, the sky, and I. I it started with the Northern Lights. When, when you and I talked about them, I missed them that night. And you told the story of going up near Seymour to see them. And you looked at the, at the sky. And, you know, I, we can kind of see the sky. We can see the stars. And in Appleton, you pick out maybe the Big Dipper, some of the major yep. stars. But so many people, I, I was listening to Joe Rogan. And, and this was on a couple of different episodes. And they were, he was talking about it. And it makes sense. The percentage of people in the United States or in the world that live in metropolitan cities that, that – you mm-hmm. never see the sky. And that's just mind yeah. boggling, isn't it? Man, go out it and is. see the Absolutely. stars. You have to go out and see the sky. Yeah, you know, just get outside. Yeah. I, that's that's one of the things I don't think people do enough of. Um, get outside and explore. You know, just, yeah, just get outside of your area and just experience what's going on outside. Tash, one of my favorite nights ever and... I guess this could be a never, you know, not forgetting, but I, I, I forgot this. And, and, and it's because of the stars. It was up at Pictured Rocks, one of the most beautiful places ever. And I remember sitting on a ledge, taking my sleeping pad, making kind of a chair. And I had a little dial planisphere, the old school planisphere. And it, it's a map of the sky. And I literally spent, I don't know, a couple of hours picking out all of the constellations within, within that planisphere. And it was one of the greatest nights ever. And it's, it's you know, yeah. I mean, up until what? A hundred years ago, 50 years ago, major entertainment, I think, for everybody was just to look at the sky, to, to understand the stars, look for shooting stars. I mean, what else were you going to do at night without electricity and things like that? Right. You know, some of the cheapest things you can do are just going out and exploring, going to a state park, going to a county park, just, you know, walking on the river trails. Uh, those Those are great things to do, and they're good for you. They help mental health and everything else. And uh, we, we've definitely, as a society, gotten away from that. Preach, and, Tash. And uh, you know, it's something that we definitely definitely need to get back Hell to. Hell yeah. Preach, Tash. I love that. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I'm never forgetting that speech, Tash. Heck, you're taking care of my segment for me. But uh, how about you? What are you never forgetting? Well, I, this week, it, it's, it's appropriate to uh, not forget uh, all of those who served for our country and given us the freedoms and liberties that we yeah. have. Uh, I know my, my grandfather served in World War II. Uh, both of them 
um, one in the South Pacific realm and the other in theater, I should say, and the other in France in the European theater. Sweet. So, uh, my grandpa Hansen and grandpa Toshner, uh, you know, that thanks for everything that they did. Um, and you know, thanks for all of those who served to give us the, the things that we have. Oh, absolutely. My dad was world war two. Hard to believe. Yep. Actually, I remember, yeah. I, I, I remember, you know, the little flags that are on all the grave sites. I remember as yeah. a kid, that was our job. My, I don't, it, it, the local cemetery or whatever, where, where my grandparents would be buried. He, uh, he put the, you know, I help him put the little flags out every couple of days before Memorial day, every year, kind of a cool memory. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Absolutely. And Joe, how about yourself? Well, Tash, the, the roller derby girls talked about it. They, I think they even said throat punching and, I have a couple of throat punching friends and I'm never forgetting them. Tosh, you got to have some throat punching friends that just stick up for you thick and thin and literally not afraid to throat punch somebody. And I love that about, about friends and, and, and the roller derby girls call it out. And I said, you know what? I'm never forgetting my throat punching friends. So to my throat punching friends, cheers. They, they, I think they might know who they are, but it's Tosh, you're a throat punching friend. I know that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, the throat punching friends. Yeah, we all have them, yes. and we all know who they are, right? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> well, with that, Tash, that was a throat punching episode indeed for us. Roller Derby girls were awesome. Make sure to go check them out June 8th at, at the Supper Club event at the Fox City's uh, Exhibition Center downtown right by Jones Park. And Tash, another great episode. Always a hoot indeed. Thank you for listening to another great episode of the NoosaCast. We'd really appreciate it if you hit up our social pages, subscribe, like, follow, and don't be afraid to engage. Head over to our YouTube channel to get exclusive content like the full interviews and speeches from the past Red Smith banquets. For listening to the NoosaCast. We really appreciate your support. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and tell a friend. Help us grow by subscribing wherever you get your pods or sharing the NoosaCast. Follow us on Facebook, X, TikTok, or Instagram. One of the best ways to help us grow is to leave a five star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. 